Olivia, I'm Angela, and I'm here to bring you another in our series of videos on women's history month. While we've already explored a lot of the fascinating Galloway women this month, today I want to talk about one of the darker chapters in Galloway women's history, the witch persecutions or panics. The history of witch belief goes back a long way, but in the 16th and 17th centuries, these beliefs became fanatical and extreme. Scotland has a long history of belief in the supernatural, but during those hundred or so years of the witch panics, this belief took a much darker turn. No other country in Europe executed as many witches as Scotland per capita. This was in part due to King James VI, who took personal interest in witchcraft and believed that a group of witches had attempted to sink his ship with their magic. The beliefs surrounding witchcraft took several different forms, from the relatively benign to the outright malevolent. In the story of Adam Forrester, we heard about the rebels in the Kirk at Dulry, where Lucky Hare danced with the devil. Dulry is not the only place in Galloway where witches were spotted at their rebels. A Whithorn, a man who was a tailor and a church elder, was out plying his trade with the help of his wife when they happened across one. On returning home at night, they saw an old disused kiln burning brightly with light. Thinking it unusual, they decided to look closer. Spying through the chinks in the door, they were treated to the sight of a witch's sabbat in the full flow. The wife of the tailor recognised one of the women in attendance as the minister's wife by the unusual garter she was wearing. The following Sunday, the tailor demanded a meeting of the Kirk session where he told his tale. The minister, it's reported, declared the story a monstrosity. The tailor demanded that the minister's wife be brought before the Kirk session then and there. When she arrived, she was wearing the same unusual garter and the tailor accused her. The minister and his wife reportedly were over the borders and away before the next Sunday. A belief in witchcraft meant a belief in a witch's power to curse you, and there seemed to be many kinds of curse, curses, from a simple knot of straw that could, be put, that could put a curse on your cow, to a figure that could be stuck with pins and used to torment you, a bit like a voodoo doll. On account of this, it was considered prudent not to refuse a favour asked by someone thought to be a witch. Of course, irrational belief isn't always consistent, so a witch didn't necessarily need any provocation at all to curse you. At Dalry, the witch Jenny Mincy was employed digging seed potatoes. When she finished her work, she asked to see the garden and the coal shed. Though the witch had been paid fully and fairly, the farmer's wife swore afterwards that Jenny had cursed her anyway, for the very next day her foot had been crushed by fall falling coal in the coal shed. One of the commonest beliefs about witches was that they could magically interfere with a neighbour's livestock. A story from Kirk Maiden illustrates this belief well. There was an elderly beggar woman who lived at Kirk Maiden who was fond of butter. When she came to a farmhouse door at the clash one day to find what they had that they had none to offer, she went away muttering under her breath. The farmer himself spied her as he was returning home and wondered what had upset her so much. When he found one of his two young horses rolling around on the ground in agony, he was sure she was somehow to blame. Since she was very old and lame, he had no trouble catching up to her. She was at first reluctant to come and look at his horse, but he persuaded her. When they got back to the horse, it was still writhing about in pain. The old woman walked around it a few times, muttering to herself, then slapped it on the rear and told it, Wished! There's nothing wrong with it. The horse jumped back to its feet as if there was, had been nothing wrong at all. The same woman was passing another farm, Lokarki, where one of the cows was struggling to rise. In exchange for a wee bit of butter, she promised to open it over. On inspection, she said someone with an ill e had overlooked it. She walked around the couch two or three times, muttering to herself. Then the old beggar woman gave the cow a tap with her stick and told her she was all right. 
Gary got up and seemed to be fully restored. Of course, there were much more fanciful beliefs about the powers of witches as well, such as keeping magical familiars or making magical potions, and even having the ability to shapeshift. At the long lost village of the Druth near Loch Anvar, there lived a witch known simply as the Witch of Druth. She was locally renowned for her cures and love potions. When someone came to her for a cure, she would consult with her familiar, a giant black cat. She spoke to the cat in Gaelic and it would whisper the cure to, in her ear. If crossed, she was known to make a doll of the offending person's likeness and stick it with pins to hurt them. Reputedly, she knew and could recite the Bible from start to finish, even though she was a witch. She could take the form of a white bear, in which she liked to suck milk straight from the other cows. One day, Lord Kenmuir was out hunting with his dogs, and he spied a white bear drinking milk from a cow. Immediately suspicious, he plucked one of his silver buttons from his jacket, stuffed it down the barrel of his musket, and shot at the hare. The hare fled, and so he followed it. He followed it all the way to the druth and the witch's house where he saw a puddle of blood at the door. On entering, he discovered the witch plucking his silver button from her thigh. She promised never to practice witchcraft again, and we are told that she kept to her word. Of course, the witch panics would not have been witch panics at all if people had not believed that a witch could do you direct harm with her magic. In the Glen Kens, there was a woman who lived who was believed to be a truly evil and powerful witch, and her name was Gersie McClegg. Gersie lived at Haniston in the Gareth Glen. It was believed that she could use her magic to steal butter and sicken cows. Gersie's curses were usually spoken in Gaelic. Gersie could take the form of a black cat, allegedly, that walked on its hind legs, or of a naked boy, and she would walk up and down the Gareth Burn, driving anyone who saw her insane. If she disliked someone, she would pick up a cup and plunge it into the barrel of homebrew that she kept in her kitchen and could weave a spell that would drown them, which is quite the power for a witch who lived more than 30 miles away from the sea. There is no record of what became of Gersie. All that remains of her is her terrifying reputation. And if Gersie was bad, then Maggie Osborne from Lincolnshire was even more frightening. It was claimed that her feet had burned a permanent path in the heather out by Glen Luce, where she lived. One day, while she was out walking, she saw a funeral procession coming towards her, something that a heretic like her apparently could not abide. The story goes that she turned herself into a beetle to avoid it, and was inadvertently stepped on by a shepherd in the procession. Saved by a rut in the road, but not entirely unscathed, Maggie vowed vengeance on the shepherd. Since he was a pious man, Maggie, Maggie's curse did not take immediate effect, but one fateful day he forgot to say grace at supper and the shepherd, his wife and their ten children were killed by an avalanche of snow from a nearby hill that buried the, their home. Of course, these beliefs, beliefs might have been largely harmless if it wasn't for the fact that they could be used against you in a witch trial. There were many trials in our region for which there, was a, there is a great deal of information in old legal and Kirk records. And while not all the trials resulted in death, many accused were banished, for example, an unfortunately significant number did. Possibly the best recorded witch in the region was Elspeth McEwen. Elspeth was an elderly, educated woman who lived near Cubix at Balmaclellan. Elspeth was accused of keeping a special pin in the thatch of her roof that allowed her to steal an infinite supply of milk from her neighbour's cows. She was also accused of interfering with the laying of her neighbour's hens. When the minister's horse and one of his servants went, was sent to fetch her to take her to Dolari for interviewing, she apparently made the horse sweat blood as they climbed the brae to the manse at Dolari. It was called the Bloody Bray because of that. Elspeth McEwen was taken from the session house at Dolai to the tall of Kubri, where she was imprisoned for two years without confessing to the crimes she was accused of. 
Latterly, she spent some time sharing the top of the cells with another accused witch, Mary Miller. She would have been deprived of sleep deliberately, starved, beaten and almost certainly tortured during those two years. Finally, and under considerable duress, Elspeth confessed and was convicted and executed alongside her stalemate. A full record of the costings of her execution survives, as well as the records of the courts and officials involved in her conviction. She was burned at the stake, having first been strangled on the 24th of August 1698 at Silver Crags, Kirkcudbury. The largest witch trial in the region took place in Dumfries in 1659. In 1658, the Kirk Session of Dumfries had introduced a new resolution requiring the minister to ask from the pulpit on Sunday for people to come forward with evidence of parishioners practising witchcraft. This was later amended to stress that false accusations would be punishable, but nonetheless it seems to have generated a great deal of evidence against a large number of women. On the 2nd of April 1659, a trial of 10 women accused of witchcraft began in Dumfries. The trial continued until the 5th of April when one of the women, Helen Tate, was found not to have been clearly proven a witch. Even so, the court required £50 of security from her and banished her from Dumfries Parish. The other nine women were convicted. Their names were Agnes Cummins, Janet McGowan, Jean Todson, Margaret Clark, Janet McKendrick, Agnes Clark, Janet Corson, Helen Moorhead and Janet Callan and they were all sentenced to death. On Sunday the 13th of April 1659 all nine women were taken to the White Sands, tied to stakes, strangled and then burned in front of a large crowd of locals. The last reputed witch tried in Dumfries and Galloway was Elspeth Rule in 1709. The charges against her were that she had, was by habit and repute a witch and had used threatening expressions towards persons at enmity with her. It was claimed that she had caused both death and madness in her victims, although there doesn't seem to be any evidence of it. Convicted by the majority of the jury, she was condemned to branding on the cheek and banishment. It was reported that smoke came out of her mouth when she was branded. The Witchcraft Act of 1735 made it a crime to accuse someone else of being a witch, ending the dreadful era of witch persecution. But that, of course, was too late for those who had already been convicted and executed. It is estimated that as many as 1,500 Scottish women were executed. It's worth remembering always that not all of those accused of witchcraft were women, but about 80% of them were. Most of those women were over 40. Being different, old, alone, educated, a Gaelic speaker, or having poor mental health were all things that could lead to a woman being accused of witchcraft in Dumfries and Galloway. And that, as we have seen, could cost her her life. Thank you very much for listening. Um, you'll find that there's a, a wee tour map of all the places I've mentioned attached to this video post as well. I think it would be a good thing to have a look at that too because it's quite interesting see everything in, in, in place and time that it gives you a, a better idea of how real it all was then. Again, thank you very much for listening. If you enjoyed this, give us a like below, possibly even share it, and I'll see you next time. Take care. Bye now.